Now, the topic of attributions flows nicely into the second part of this chapter, where we talk about forming and maintaining impressions, where attributions help us form impressions. The attribution allows us to determine, is that action telling us something about the person, or is that action due to the environment? So how we attribute different behaviors can influence what we think of or the impression that we have of other people. But of course, there's a lot more to it than just what we've attributed to that person versus their environment. Impressions have a lot of other factors that we can talk about. Now, when forming in impressions of people, we tend to see something called the primacy effect, where earlier impressions or earlier information that we're given about someone uh, tends to be more easily recalled and we tend to give a little bit more weight to the information that we get earlier on. So we're going to be a little bit more alert to the information that we receive first and that initial information might even start shaping how we perceive any information that comes after it. In the textbook, they uh, use the example of telling someone that you know a person who is intelligent, industrious, impulsive, critical, stubborn, and envious. Um, or you could also phrase it as they are envious, stubborn, critical, impulsive, industrious, and intelligent. Now, those are the same words, just in different orders. And interestingly, that first group of words, if you're told that they are first intelligent and industrious, people tend to form a more positive impression of that individual than if you were first told that they are envious and stubborn. So that earlier information can shape how you form this impression, and so that first piece of information is really critical in how you're going to interpret and make an impression of someone else. Now, people are really good at forming very quick judgments based on this primacy effect, where the first information that we have, we can immediately form an impression of someone and feel like we know how to interact with them and what to make of them. But it's important to note that we're not just slaves to this primacy effect. There is also something called the recency effect. If you remember where uh, we talked about primacy and recency probably back in 104, um, just in terms of remembering lists and things, but we also have the ability to remember things that have happened most recently. And over time, we can get away from our primacy effects. We can overcome our initial impression of someone, and we can be more influenced by things that we've seen them do recently. We can add more weight to actions that we've seen them take in more recent times, and we can overcome our initial impression. So our first impressions aren't everything. Next, we're going to talk about our mental sets and schemas, where we can start seeing the things that we expect to see. Now, we've kind of touched already on schemas back in the chapter on language, but we're going to get into it just a little bit more here. Um, so when we talk about a mental set, we're talking about that you're perceiving the world in a very particular way. It's basically what we're prepared to view or what we're prepared to interpret. And that preparedness can actually affect how we interpret information that comes in after the fact. If you're not ready to receive certain information, you might completely ignore it. So your mental set is going to determine which information you're focusing on. Now we've talked about schemas as something that helps us create these mental sets. Schemas being mental frameworks that are going to help us organize and interpret information. So if you are going to go and meet someone and someone warns you, hey, that person is um, aloof and a little bit cold, so don't be, um, don't be nervous if they're not really that warm and friendly. So you might have that preconceived mental set from a schema of what someone who is cold and unwelcoming might feel like. So you have these pre-existing frameworks that you now interpret that person that you're expecting to meet. 
We can also run into stereotypes here. And stereotypes are a powerful type of schema. So they're going to be generalized beliefs that apply to a group or a category. In a lot of cases, a group or category of people. And so because a stereotype is a form of schema, it can shape our perception. So one study that looked at this had a video recording of a child. They called her Hannah. And people were asked to rate Hannah on her academic potential. So how good of a student is she going to be in the future? And one group of people asked to evaluate Hannah's performance were told that Hannah came from a middle class family, an upper middle class family, and therefore had sort of a wealthy background. The other group were told that Hannah came from a blue collar family where she wasn't wealthy, her family was poor. And so all of these people, the only thing they had to know about Hannah was observing her behavior in that moment and this background schema or stereotype that she came from either a semi-wealthy or a poor family. And the researchers found that these people would evaluate Hannah more positively when they had been told that she was from an upper middle class background. And they would evaluate her more poorly if she came from a poor background. So these stereotypes can start influencing how we perceive that behavior. And in this specific case, they had shown each group or each individual the exact same recording of Hannah's behavior. So it wasn't that they were picking up on different behaviors, it was the exact same tape. They were just framing it using a different stereotype. So it can have a dramatic effect on what we're seeing, and we can start seeing things that we expect to see. Which leads us to the next topic, which is the idea of self-fulfilling prophecies where not only are we interpreting information in the light that we expect to interpret it, now we start creating what we expect to see. So a self-fulfilling prophecy is basically this idea that your expectations are going to affect your behavior towards others, which will cause that expected behavior to confirm your expectations. So we can use this example over here where um, you're told that your friend or this person, George, that you're going to meet is unfriendly. So you expect now that George is unfriendly. So maybe when you meet George, you're going to act coldly towards him because, well, you've been told he's an unfriendly person, so I'm not going to bother to be warm to him. So you're going to behave in an unfriendly or guarded manner. And that behavior, your actions, are going to cause George to respond in an unfriendly way because, well, you were unfriendly first. But George acting in an unfriendly way is going to confirm your expectation that George is friendly. So here, in this case, you don't actually know if George is unfriendly or not because the only action we see by George is that he's responding in the same way that you acted towards him. So George might be a really friendly person, but because you acted unfriendly towards him, he acted unfriendly in response, and your uh, original expectation is confirmed. So we've experienced a self-fulfilling prophecy where by having your expectation and acting in a way that's consistent with your expectation, you've created an outcome that's also consistent with that expectation. So our next section is actually a little bit separate from impressions, but related. So we're going to start talking about attitudes and attitude change, where attitude is a positive or negative evaluative reaction towards a stimulus. So you're going to evaluate a particular stimulus, like a person or an action or an object or a concept, as being either positive or negative. You're going to interpret it as positive or negative. And your decision to evaluate this as positive or negative is going to be supported by your personal beliefs and values. So for example, we can look at your attitude towards smoking cigarettes. 
Um, and so this particular person's values have quite a few negatives, these purple boxes. So the negatives of smoking cigarettes, uh, your friends dislike smoking, your roommates dislike it, it makes you smell bad, it's expensive, there's lots of health risks, those are all negative. There are a couple of positives, so maybe um, being relaxed from smoking cigarettes helps you with relaxing to study, it re reduces social discomfort. So there are some positives there. So you can evaluate the negatives and the positives and you determine that overall this person has a negative evaluation of smoking. So the stimulus of smoking cigarettes is deemed to be negative by this person based on all of their personal beliefs and values. So their own interpretation of the situation, they determine that it's negative. Now that we understand what these attitudes are, we can ask if our attitudes actually influence our behavior. Now in the textbook, the authors describe the idea that a lot of people have particular attitudes. Um, at the time, they used the example of touring the United States with a young Chinese couple and going to restaurants and hotels and different establishments to see if anyone would show prejudice against an Asian couple. Because at the time, back in the 30s, there was a lot of prejudice towards Asians. And so um, at a lot of these places, they went to over 200 different sites and they didn't end up getting declined service very often. In most cases, they were able to go in and rent a hotel room or eat a meal and had no problems. However, when the researchers decided to call those establishments and ask if they would serve someone who was of Asian descent, most of them were told on the phone that they would never serve someone of that descent. And so we run into this issue where their attitude was very negative, but the behavior that was observed didn't match that attitude. So to try and pick apart whether there is an influence of attitude on behavior, researchers have tried to pull apart what's actually going on, what's driving these situations when attitude and behavior work together, or conversely, where they don't quite match up like they saw in that original study. The first of these factors that influence a strong attitude-behavior relationship, um, meaning that your attitude will match the behavior that's observed, um, this relationship is strongest when our situational factors are weak. Basically saying that strong situational factors can make it difficult for you to behave in a way that matches your attitude. So you might feel pressure, a financial incentive, the idea of conformity or obedience. Um, maybe you're in a group and don't want to act out. Those environmental or situational factors, if they're strong, they can keep you from acting on your own personal attitude. So in our example of whether people would refuse to serve a couple who was of Asian descent, um, there were a very strong situational factors at work because if you turn someone away from a restaurant, then you're causing a scene. You're not making money from them being there and eating a meal. So in those cases, it kind of makes sense why there was a mismatch between the attitude that was reported on the phone and the behavior that was observed in person. I'm actually going to hop ahead one slide and talk about the theory of planned behavior because that relates to this situational factors here. So this theory of planned behavior and other theories that fall in the same vein say that our intention to engage in a behavior is going to be strongest when there's a positive attitude toward that behavior. Basically thinking that I'm doing the right thing. It's also going to be strong when our subjective norms, our perceptions of what other people think that we should be doing, also line up with our attitudes. And it's going to be strong when our belief that that behavior is under personal control is also strong. So basically, you're going to do a behavior that 
you think is a good behavior to do, that other people will also think is good, and that you think that you have the um, sort of self-motivation or the ability to do this thing and you have the choice to do that action. So having all three of these factors leads you to feel that you have a strong personal um, influence and that you should be able to act out. And so if you have a strong personal drive or a strong personal factor driving this behavior, then you're focusing less on situational factors that might interfere. Um, so if you believe strongly in that particular attitude, you might start seeing more of those behaviors that match that attitude. So that's how those tie together. Our second factor that we want to look at is, um, are the attitudes that you have, um, or, or are you aware of the attitudes that you have, and are you strongly behind them? Some people will have sort of ingrained attitudes. Maybe you were raised in a particular way and your gut reaction is to respond in a certain fashion. So if you're not aware of your attitude or if you don't have a strong belief, then maybe you're not going to act on that attitude or belief. People who are aware of their attitudes and believe strongly in those attitudes, people who are able to think and reflect on what they believe and why they think that way are a lot more likely to have a match between their attitude and their behavior. So if they're aware of what they believe and they believe it strongly, they're more likely to act on that belief and we get a match between their attitude and behavior. And for our third point here, um, <clears throat> and our last point here is that our attitudes are a lot better at predicting general rather than specific classes of behavior. So sometimes you're not going to be seeing a strong attitude behavior relationship simply because you're having very specific attitudes that aren't very well associated with the general behavior or vice versa. Um, so we do a lot better at uh, predicting general classes of behavior rather than a specific class of behavior. So the textbook uses the example of people who have um, religious tendencies or a religious attitude where they are, um, they think of themselves as religious people, they won't necessarily engage in every single specific religious behavior that you could measure, but they do tend to show an overall trend towards religious behavior. So we're a lot better at relating our attitudes to those general behaviors and a lot less likely to relate them to a specific precise behavior. Now for the next section, there's actually a typo here. So instead of do our attitudes influence our attitudes, it should be saying, does our behavior influence our attitudes? Um, so that's what we're going to talk about is how our behavior can influence our attitudes. Because we just finished talking about how our attitudes influence our behavior, but we can also see this effect going in the other direction. So Imagine that as part of the research participation for this course, you're asked to go and do a really, really boring survey. And it's gonna take you a whole hour of answering the most inane questions you can imagine. At the end, the researcher tells you that they need someone to help them recruit people to participate in this study. And they're gonna give you some money to tell other people that the study was really interesting and that they should go and participate. And so some people would be given $1 and told, go recruit others. Other people are given $20 and asked to go recruit others. The people who were given $20 and told to recruit others ended up evaluating this boring survey task as more interesting than either a control group who didn't have to lie and tell other people that it was interesting, or even more than the people who were only given one dollar to tell the lie. The reason for this weird um, increase in enjoyment of this boring task actually comes from the idea of cognitive dissonance. And so this cognitive dissonance theory says that we're trying to find consistency in how we're viewing the world. 
We want things to match up. So our own view of ourselves, we might think of ourselves as, well, I'm an honest person. I am a good person and I tell the truth. But you've just had to do something where you tell a white lie that this was an interesting task to try and help someone out. So you run into this inconsistency in those two factors. So your view of I am an honest person has been challenged by your actions where I didn't do an honest thing. And so this creates cognitive dissonance. The two behaviors don't quite line up. And so you uh, are driven or motivated to try and change one of these two aspects, try and change the scenario to alleviate this dissonance. And so a lot of people will convince themselves that, well, it must not have been that boring of an activity because I told other people that I liked it. So their actions, their telling other people that it was an okay and interesting activity, makes them reevaluate their attitude towards that activity. These situations where we're behaving in a way that goes against our attitude would be called counter-attitudinal behavior, where your behavior doesn't match your attitude. And we see this cognitive dissonance occurring, especially in situations where that action, that behavior, was freely chosen. So you have this logic of, I chose to do this thing, does that mean that I actually believe that that behavior was the right thing to do? So in the case of evaluating that uh, study and telling others that it was a good study, you chose to tell people that you uh, enjoyed the study. So does that mean that you actually enjoyed the study? Trying to get rid of that cognitive dif dissonance. Now, Having this cognitive dissonance doesn't always lead to an attitude change. Um, people are really good at rationalizing their behavior and finding external justifications. Things like, well, I was paid to do it and now I owe the researcher something in return. Something like that. So you can always kind of worm your way around that where um, it doesn't necessarily permanently change your attitude. The next theory that we want to talk about is the self-perception theory. And this theory kind of builds off of what we had already talked about in terms of forming inferences and attitudes towards others, where by observing other people and their behavior, you can make inferences about what they believe. So if you see someone campaigning for a particular political party, you would logically assume that they support that party. The self-perception theory kind of applies that concept, but to ourselves, where we can make inferences about our own attitudes by observing our own behavior. So we can infer how we must be feeling, or we can infer our own attitudes based on how we act. So if we look at that same example where you were telling people that the process of doing the surveys wasn't that boring, that you found it interesting, someone who follows this self-perception theory would be evaluating and saying that, well, I told people that it was a good study, I told them that they should do it too, so I must believe that it was a good study. So that change doesn't come from cognitive dissonance. It actually comes from you reevaluating your own behaviors and assuming your attitudes from those behaviors. And of course, if we want to evaluate which of these two theories is the best to explain attitudinal change, the answer is it depends. Our cognitive dissonance theory is better when trying to explain why people are changing their views after behaving in a way that contradicts their clearly defined attitudes. Self-perception theory is better for situations where that behavior isn't really threatening someone's self-worth um, or when it's looking at behaviors that people have weakly held. 
So the self-perception theory is a lot better when it's something that you don't hold a lot of weight to, where this attitude isn't something where it's part of your core identity. So self-perception theory is, yeah, I didn't feel strongly about doing this task or not doing the task, so maybe I must have enjoyed it because I don't know how I felt about it. Whereas cognitive dissonance theory is more for those times when you have a clearly defined attitude that you've changed. Now our last couple of slides for this section are going to deal with persuasion. And persuasion is going to be a process that involves a communicator, someone who's delivering a particular message through a specific channel. Um, this channel could be writing or verbal or a visual system of some sort. And they're trying to get this message to an audience within a particular context. Um, and the context could be a cultural setting or something else. But we can evaluate this system, we can evaluate how persuasive a particular argument is based on different aspects of this system. So we can evaluate the communicator, we can evaluate the message that they're sending, and we can also look at the audience that they're targeting. Um, and of course, as you can assume, there's lots more going on in the background and you could look at persuasion so much more in depth than we can in this course, um, but we're going to stick to these three major aspects of this process of persuasion. Starting with number one, the communicator. So the first thing that you want to evaluate about your communicator is their credibility. How believable is this person? Um, how much should I trust them? How much do I believe what they're saying? So you can evaluate their credibility and how much weight you want to give what they're saying. And the credibility of the communicator is often a really important part of persuasion. If you have a communicator who has zero credibility, you're not going to pay attention to the message at all. Um, so for example, if you have a friend who always comes up with harebrained schemes and they're always just spouting nonsense, the next time they come up to you and tell you that they have the best idea ever, you've heard it before. They have no credibility because this is nothing new and you're not even going to hear the message because this person is always going on about the next best thing. Um, whereas if you have someone who you trust and rely on, maybe you're going to listen to their message and you're going to put more weight behind what they're telling you because they are credible. Our next thing to consider is the message. When presenting this information, whatever it is you're trying to persuade people of, studies have shown that you're much better off uh, arguing for both sides or giving information on both sides of the argument and refuting the side that you don't agree with. So you're not going to do very well if you just present the arguments that support your side. You're going to do a lot better if you also say that, um, I believe this because of this, other people believe that for another reason, but that's not true because of this reason. So you're using extra information to refute the other side of the argument. So not only are you giving support to your side of the argument, but you're removing support, removing credibility from the other side of the message as well. Um, and you're also going to be perceived as less biased if you're giving information on both sides of the issue. When trying to convince a group of people whose view is very different from your own, you have to decide if you should make an extreme argument or find sort of a moderate middle ground to argue from. If the audience disagrees with you, you're a lot better off with a moderate degree of discrepancy. So you don't want to go to an extreme. You want to find sort of that middle ground so that they can come a little bit towards you, but don't assume that you can throw the most extreme argument at them and that they will just come to it. Um, 
there's a little bit of leeway here where if you are someone with high credibility, if you are someone that they trust, you can present more extreme arguments and still have success in persuading them. But it is more risky to go that way. Some people will choose to arouse fear to try and get people to switch over to their viewpoint. If you can make people feel afraid, they might be more likely to listen to your argument because you're offering them some shelter from that fear. But that only really works, uh, or it works best, when the message invokes moderate to strong fear and you can offer a fairly easy way to reduce that threat. Um, if you overwhelm people with too many fearful thoughts and ideas, they might just refuse to listen to you. So it's kind of easy to overdo making people feel afraid to switch them over to your point of view because they can just ignore you if it's too frightening or if it's too unbelievable. And the third thing to consider is the audience that you're trying to approach. Some people will respond very positively to logical outlines of information. Um, if you can give them a logical and well-researched argument, you might win some people over. Others may not care at all. Now, the audience can take two different routes when being persuaded. They can either follow a central route to persuasion, where the audience members will think carefully about the message, what you're trying to tell them. And they may find your arguments compelling and they may be moved to be persuaded because of the message and how it's been presented. The other thing that we sometimes see is a peripheral route to persuasion, where some people are influenced more by factors other than the message and the arguments you're presenting. Some people might be influenced by the authority or the appearance of the person doing the persuading. They may be influenced more by the emotional appeal associated with this message. Now, which of these two routes is better? Um, again, it depends. Um, most of the time, this central route to persuasion is going to be best because the attitude changes are going to last longer. So people who were influenced by the message and by how it was presented and the logical arguments that came with it, they're going to change their attitudes more permanently and that change will allow us to better predict their future behavior. Now, people will follow this central route when the argument is particularly relevant to them. So if it matters, if they have a high personal relevance or a high involvement, they're usually going to focus on the message that's being presented to them. So if you're trying to convince someone of something that is core to their life, they're going to pay more attention to the message and the arguments that you're using. But we will still see some differences because different people have different needs for cognition. So some people have a high need for cognition where they really just like to hear the arguments. They want to hear the logic and they want to follow the message through. So those people are going to be more biased towards following a central route. Others have less of a concern for those cognitive arguments. They're less concerned with the message, and they may tend to follow a more peripheral route. 